And I was forced into a situation where I had to be still. And I took a year of being still. I read a book a week. I watched a ton of documentaries. I was incredibly depressed. I knew it would pass. Um, But that time being still changed my life for the better. And when I see friends on the hamster wheel, I'm like, yo, turn everything off. Don't worry about what you look like today. Open a book, play some soft music and be still like you won't be able. But now I run into a lot of response back to me where I don't really like to be still. Like I get FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. What do you tell someone, Crystal, when they refuse to jump off because they're afraid of being still? Because being still does scare people. What I say is that was me 100%. I I couldn't stand it. If you look back at my life when I was, um, you know, probably 20 and before and even into my 20s, absolutely not. It felt very dangerous. And so when I when I meet with somebody and I they say to me that they don't want to slow down or they can't slow down, I just get really curious about what is the fear of what would happen if they did. Let's just really look at it. And like for me, my fear was what if I discover that I'm ultimately an incredibly lazy person and I never get moving again? What if my exhaustion is so deep that I can't, I can't ever re- recover from it? Or I think another fear that many people have is more existential of what if I slow down and I realize that everything I've been doing is actually in the wrong direction and I have to like reinvent my life and I would have to tear everything down and destroy it. And I can't do that. So I may as well just keep going forward like a sunk cost bias. So whenever somebody says they can't slow down, I'd say, okay, don't keep going at your clip and let's just talk about what those fears are. Let's just explore that. And usually as we confront the fears while still being busy and doing a lot, we start to realize, you know, maybe these fears aren't a really good reason to not slow down. And I'll I'll slow down by 0.01%. And small gradients, as you noticed, once you get comfortable with slowing down, you never want to go back because it's so rich and you learn and discover so much that actually makes everything you do when you're doing optimized. You're like, oh, why didn't somebody tell me this 20 years ago? But getting there, people have to come to it in their own way, just like you did. You were forced to do it in a way that was a blessing in the moment. Maybe you didn't feel like it was. And I think everybody comes to it in their own way. But for the ones that resist, I always say, let's just get really curious about the fear of what would happen if you had to stop. I mean, that's a great way to look at it. And you're right. When you do start doing stuff again, you become more selective with the things that you're doing, whether it's as simple as when you're younger, you're afraid that if you don't keep in touch with all of your friends and go out when they're all going out and everyone's doing things that you're going to lose those friendships. And so there's that fear. There's that level of FOMO. But when you reel it in a little bit and take time where maybe one night a week you're taking a bath and you're just enjoying your own free space, whether it's a TV show you like or a book you want to read, when you do see your friends, which I realize, you value that time so much more. You're not exhausted. And I can remember a time where every spot in my planner had to be full. Oh, what am I, who am I going out with this night? Who am I going out? And, and, you know, you're never catching up on your own personal things, whether it's, you know, doctor's appointments, whether it's laundry, whether it's, you know, keeping tabs with family, writing letters to friends, whatever you like to do that you stop doing because you think you're too busy to do it. Getting people back on track with that must be one of the greatest feelings for you because it changes the trajectory of your entire existence. You you plan things with more love. You're so much more excited to do them. Everything becomes more of a special event and your time as well becomes a special event. So once you see people starting to transition, what's it feel like for you as a coach, Crystal, when somebody comes to you and says, wow. I spent the weekend just like on my own, just like putzing around in my closet or doing something at home. And you knew that was soulful time for them. That must be incredibly rewarding. Oh, you know, the the work that I do, I can't imagine doing anything that's more rewarding. It's, I have like this achy face sometimes from smiling so hard in my days where it's just, it must be how parents feel when they watch their kids coming into their potential and blooming. And the and there's like this positive feedback loop too, where once they get it, 
they're not ever going to lose it. You can feel the momentum that just starts to occur because it's so, it feels so good to have that space to connect with yourself. Like when I go back to that thing you said about boundaries, it makes me think about when we, when we're struggling in life, whether it's boundaries with our time, with uh, social media, with other people, with money, how we spend it, whatever the boundary may be, I can guarantee you that the core boundary that is broken or not working so well is a boundary with ourself. If we don't have time to connect with this person right here and have a good relationship, then how do you expect the other boundaries to function? Because this is the foundational boundary. And so that time that you're describing, like just having a weekend, like puts around in your closet and be with yourself and just see what's there has this ripple effect to everything else in life. And for, for me as a coach and as a therapist, what I like is the holistic nature of the work. They might come to me saying, I have this issue in my professional life. And guess what? We're going to talk about all the things because it's natural because you're at the center of it. And I'm really here just for you in whatever context that may be. So it's deeply rewarding. And as you can tell, I could get on a soapbox all day about it. (laughs) I mean, it's incredible. And you're working regularly with clients for a period of time. What type of homework do you give your clients as a coach to, because you can't be with them every day, right? You're, you're, You're having these curious conversations, you're feeding through the data and they're discovering themselves. And what type of homework do you give and do you suggest for someone? Well, the two things I use most often, because just just what you said, I can't be with them all the time, but I want to be. So my way of doing that, of riding on their shoulder throughout the course of a week, is I I customize for each of my clients a tracker. If they're okay with spreadsheets, some people are allergic and that's cool and I can work around (laughs) it. But if they're okay with with the spreadsheet, and I love spreadsheets, then I have a tracker But we're just documenting what's going on in their day. And I'd have different things I'd want to measure. Some of them might be numeric, like how many times do you do something? Others might be an entry where you're, you know, writing a little sentence about what happened. So I can watch you, but it's really more for the person because as they're documenting, it's just about being reflective and intentional. So those are two words that are huge in everything that I do with my clients is be intentional about how you do things, how you spend your time, what actions you take, what words you use. And then reflect on what you've done and modify it from there. It's not about beating yourself up. It's just saying, hey, did that work for me or not? And if not, I'm going to adjust it. And the other thing that I do for people who don't really like trackers is I have a reflection log. It's more like a journal that I share with them. So they can just go in and more in an open format, sort of spill onto a page, their reflection of the day. And those are two ways that I find to be very powerful in helping my clients cultivate a deeper connection with themselves and how they are Uh, engaging with their life. 